Hey folks, welcome to a brand new episode of Smart Money. It's the weekend and we're here to talk about uh, important issues, how to plan your money, how to save, how to create a retirement corpus. Our, um, you, our topic for today is very, very important. It's financialization of your savings. Now, did you know that 95% of Indian households invest their money only in physical assets, which is either gold or real estate, which means that they're hardly beating inflation. They're not even creating any wealth. So you work so hard, you get a salary, but then all of that goes into inflation. Our expert today, Saurabh Mukherjee, the founder of Masterless Investment Managers, is going to help us tackle this issue. He's going to tell us how you can make the most of moving your assets from physical assets to financial assets. Saurabh, thanks so much for joining us. You know, ever since I put up this topic on social media, I got bombarded with messages right. because so many people are still averse towards investing into equities. And it's strange, right? Because, I mean, the market is at an all-time high. One would think that people would be more, uh, people would sort of go all into equities. But 95% people are still in only gold and, and real estate. So how does one really um, explain to them what the course of action should be? So thanks, Sonia. It's a, it's a fascinating subject and I'm glad uh, you invited uh, me to discuss it. I'm glad I get a chance to, to, to talk about financialization with your viewers. If you ask me, this is probably the most pressing issue facing Indian households and you know, how to toggle from what has historically been in our country what has historically been our country, the preferred mode of savings, which is buy flats, buy, buy gold, buy, you know, put your money in FDs and so on. That's traditionally been the mode of savings. That's what our parents' generation did. Now, it worked for them because, uh, at, you know, 20 years ago, inflation in India, CPI inflation, was around 2, 3, 4 percent. So your, if you earned 5 percent after tax, that was all right. Your wealth wasn't depleting. For your and my generation, by and large, cost of, infl cost of living is going up at 6, 7, perhaps a little higher than that. And therefore, the, the old-fashioned style of investing in physical assets, low-risk financial assets, doesn't quite deliver the goods. It's resulting in systematic depletion of assets. And therefore, for the, over the last 10 years, what I realized, and, and this, this point became very clear to me when I was writing uh, my book, uh, uh, Coffee Can Investing, The Low Risk Route to Stupendous Wealth, when I, was, when I was writing that, I realized there's a whole generation of Indians who have built a, you know, a pot, pot of uh, physical savings through hard work, but that pot is depleting. And over the course of, say, a 20-year retirement, much of their wealth will be drained away. So this is probably the most pressing issue facing Indians. There's a lot of inertia, as you rightly put it, even though the stock market's done pretty well over the last eight, nine months. There's a lot of inertia. People still have you know, some trepidation about the stock market. What they don't realize is if they do not, do not invest in the stock market intelligently and conservatively, their wealth is going to deplete systematically over the next decade, over the next 20 years. And basically, if you deplete your wealth at, say, 1% or 2% a year, over 10 to 20 years, you're going to lose half of your wealth. Uh, and that's what's, I think that's going to cost a whole generation of Indians. So it's really important that through, through mediums like this, through programs like this, we're able to get the message out that people need to invest in the stock market and do so intelligently and conservatively to augment their wealth. You know, uh, it's interesting you say that our parents' generation, there was just 2 to 3% inflation, so they could even uh, beat inflation by just investing into, you, you know, uh, FDs or gold. So mm. many people reached out to me saying that their parents are still stuck in FDs. They don't want to get out of it because they feel like, you know, at least the capital is protected. So what exactly does financialization of savings really mean? And how does one go about financializing one's, uh, you know, one's savings or one's salary pot? So, so I think you know, it's, a, it's a buzzword that's become very popular over the last couple of years, financialization of savings. In simple English, it means taking your wealth, your earnings, and transferring them from, from physical assets such as land and flats and, and jewelry, transferring them from physical assets to, to assets such as mutual funds, insurance, direct equities. Right? That's the simple process we're talking about. Um, it's tricky because the mental shift required is quite quite uh, you know quite profound mm. the mental shift is rather than buying bars of gold mm. and rather than buying you know flats one after the other uh, i'm going to invest in financial assets especially equity related assets do fluctuate in value and that's what makes people uh, 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 apprehensive 
But what they don't realize is you can, you can invest intelligently in equities, compound your wealth at a steady rate, the whole notion of consistent compounding that my colleagues and I have, that, that, that we've tried to popularize. You can consistently compound in equities as opposed to consistently depleting your wealth in, financial, in physical assets. So financialization is gradually moving out of physical assets little at a time into the world of insurance, mutual funds, direct equities, doing so in an intelligent and conservative way so that your wealth grows at a steady pace. Okay, so let's find out step by step how to do that, right? You said insurance, you said mutual funds. Uh, people keep asking me, how do I pick a mutual fund? How do I know which fund manager is good? What if my returns deplete over the next two years? So we'll start with the proportion of your overall savings. If I earn 100 rupees, how much should I put into equity so that I can generate wealth for myself and not erode my salary into inflation? So, so I'll, I'll volunteer my thoughts, but before I do that, uh, I'll give a caveat. Uh, uh, you know, whilst I have passed the relevant exams, there's a SEBI exam for registered investment advisor. I've passed the exams. They were they were hard work. Um, and the second exam especially was hard work. Uh, whilst I have passed uh, the, the relevant exams, uh, I, uh, Marcel is, the, is not a is not in the business of providing financial advice. Mm. What anyone watching this program can do is go to the SEBI website. There are literally uh, thousands of uh, registered investment advisors, contact details and names given there and choose a, a qualified uh, a registered investment advisor to take you through this journey, to take you through the journey of identifying your financial goals and basis your financial goals, creating a, a financial plan for yourself. But broadly speaking, I'll give you the quick process. If you want more on it, it's, I'll discuss this process in greater detail in my latest book, The Victory Project, Six Steps to Peak Potential. The, the, the quick and dirty on the process is, you first get a grip on your financial goals, right? What exactly are you saving for? Are you saving for your children's education? Are you saving for your retirement? Are you saving for a you know, nice holiday home in the Himalayas? Be very clear about your financial goals. Then translate those financial goals into an investment plan. And broadly speaking, just to sort of simplify it for the purposes of this program, there are two broad areas you're looking at. One is a pool of safe harbor assets, rainy day assets, which hold their value, which are very steady in value, which will always be there in case something goes awry in your life. So government bonds, government bond mutual funds, fixed deposits fall in that category, assets which hold the value. And the second pool of assets is risk assets. Now there's a whole you know, world of risk assets there, ranging from private equity funds to venture capital through to mutual funds, AIFs. But in simple parlance, equities, to use a broad parlance, equities should be the vast majority of your risk assets. Now, should equities be 60, 70, 80% of your portfolio? That's the discussion you and your financial advisor needs to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and broadly speaking, the risk-free assets, 10, 20, 30, 40%, the risk-oriented assets, equities to take the most popular class, 60, 70, 30, that split is the whole process of asset allocation, which you and your financial advisor do. This is only done after you've very clearly identified what your financial goals are. Okay, and I think top of my, you started by saying retirement, children's education and then holiday home. I think I'm going to do that in reverse. First is a holiday home for me and then children's education and then retirement, right? But uh, jokes aside, we have a lot of queries coming in right now. So I just want to take them one by one. Uh, Pavan Bhansali has written to us sure. saying, how do you split your salary between guaranteed income options and instruments that are subject to market risk? So uh, that's the first question that we're getting at the moment. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, now this is what you just pointed out, right? Risk-free assets and risky assets. But if I want a guaranteed income option, what do I do? Yeah. And instruments subject to market risk, how do you split it? Right. I think that's the big sort of point that I've tried to convince uh, a, a lot of our clientele. Um, in our country, guaranteed income products are very popular, but they're often misleading. And I'll explain to you what the, the sort of the background is. Till 15, 20 years ago, um, Indian government bonds, the 10-year government bond in India 15 years ago was giving an yield of 15, 16 percent. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and when our country was an underdeveloped economy, just on government bonds themselves, you could get very, very high yields. It's in that era that these guaranteed return products became very popular, right? Now, in the last uh, 15 years, the 10-year government bonds yield has dropped from 15, 16% to say 6% today. So today, if you want a guaranteed return, the, which, and the simplest way to guarantee yourself a return is to buy a 10-year government of India bond, 6% before tax is as good as it gets. 
And if you buy one of the tax-free bonds, you can get, say, 5.5% or 5% after tax. Right? 5% after tax, 6% before tax, that's broadly the area of guaranteed returns. Now, a lot of people get suckered into guaranteed return products which offer 8, 9, 10%. Those are misleading. Be very, very careful of that. Right? So if you want your returns guaranteed, I'm afraid you're not going to make a return much higher than inflation. If you want returns better than inflation, you do have to take a level of risk. Right? That's the, uh, we, have, we have moved from being a socialist economy to by and large a free market economy. And if you want to create wealth for yourself, I'm afraid there is no risk-free way to stupendous wealth. You do have to take uh, a reasonable amount of risk. The challenge is, and the skill is, how do you take risk in a conservative manner, in an intelligent manner, so, the, so that your wealth augments. And that's the whole skill of investing intelligently in equity. So your risk-free products, government bonds, fixed deposits, will get you in the vicinity of 5-6%. That's the safe harbor pot, right? And how much should you allocate to that? Well, how much do you want as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as an income stream for yourself, come what may? Mm. If that number, for instance, is 10 lakhs, if you want to have 10 lakhs on an assured basis for yourself, then I'm afraid you're looking at close to 1.5 crores of savings in risk-free products if you want a guaranteed income every year of, of, of 10 lakhs, right? Because you just have to take the 5% and, and back it out. Mm. Beyond that, if you want returns north of inflation, you do have to take some risk. And the whole construct that I've explained in Coffee Can Equities or, or in my book, Unusual Billionaires, uh, about how do you build a, uh, uh, an equity portfolio which gives you steady, consistent compounding comes into play there. If you don't have the time to do that yourself, you can find a fund manager who can do that for you, mutual funds uh, for the mass, masses, and AIFs and PMSs for H&Ws are products which are already out there in the public for you to invest in and access the skill of professional fund managers to build your, to build your equity corpus and thus to compound your wealth. Okay, that is a lot of information and very essential information on how you should compound your wealth and not just be stuck in physical assets that, you know, really don't give you any kind of return. Uh, but let's do one thing. We're getting a lot of questions. We need to take a short commercial break. Don't go anywhere. We will come back with our guest in just a bit on Smart Money. Welcome back to Smart Money. We're having a very interesting discussion with Saurav Mukherjee, the founder of Masterless Investment Managers, about financialization of savings, which is, I think, the most pressing topic at the moment. Everyone is earning a salary, but no one is creating wealth because they're investing it only in physical assets, which uh, pretty much don't beat inflation and don't give you returns. So, Saurav, you know, before the break, we were discussing that one should invest into equities, mutual funds, etc. But tell us how to go about it. Within equities, should I save directly? Should I save through a fund manager? And how do I trust any fund manager? You know, because at the end of the day, you and me know because we've been in the market for 10, 15 years. But an average person on the street doesn't know how good or bad the fund manager is. Absolutely. Look, I think uh, most people have, you know, very demanding day jobs and they probably can't dedicate the sort of time required to read annual reports, assess the quality of uh, accounts, assess the quality of the franchise. And therefore, for, for the vast majority of people watching this program, investing uh, in, 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 in equities through a mutual fund is probably the best way to best way to go for it. Um, there are financial advisors there who will tell you what mutual funds are are appropriate for you. In my book, Coffee Can Investing, I have uh, also highlighted the merits of investing in index funds, funds which track the Nifty, uh, track the Sensex, and give you returns which are uh, almost identical to the Nifty or Sensex. And the cost of these are very low. You're looking at 0.05%, 0.1%. Low cost mutual funds called index funds, really, really worth considering in terms of gaining exposure to equities at a low cost. There are high quality mutual equity mutual funds in our country, but for that, you need to work with an advisor mm -hmm. uh, uh, rather than just you know having a wild guess yourself. Beyond that, if you can in afford to invest more than 50 lakhs, uh, SEBI has created uh, PMS services, portfolio management services for, for people who can afford to invest more than 50 lakhs in one go. And if you can afford to invest more than one crore, then SEBI has created the alternative investment fund category. So there are different ways to assess the services of professional fund managers in an affordable construct, in, package, in a packaged financial services construct. I would strongly recommend that you look into these. Uh, and if you don't want to pay uh, top dollar, if you want to just pay you know, a budget fee, a low fee, then consider index funds. 
Okay, consider index funds. Uh, we're getting a lot of questions. So let me take some of them very quickly. Arun Garg has written to us. His question is, most people's understanding in debt investments is limited to fixed deposits and the National Savings Certificate or the NSC. Uh, so awareness in general is very limited in debt, debt instruments. Can you throw more light on this, Saurabh? So look, I think de debt instruments, uh, uh, specifically debt mutual funds, are actually a big asset class, right? It's a very diverse asset class. You have very risky debt mutual funds called credit risk funds. You have very low risk debt mutual funds uh, uh, at the other end called short term debt funds, liquid funds and so on. If you do want to invest in uh, in the debt mutual funds which are giving higher yields, say 7, 8, 9%, I would suggest you get uh, professional advice from an IFA. Uh, uh, if you don't want to get professional advice, you want to do debt mutual funds yourself, I would say look at government bond mutual mm -hmm. funds. There are several large, well-run gov uh, government bond mutual funds which only invest in either Government of India issued bonds or bonds issued by the state governments. They give you yields similar to government bonds, so uh, a long-term government bond mutual fund will give you uh, returns in the vicinity of, of six odd percent. Um, and there is you know, a low-cost way to, to uh, uh, get exposure to the uh, to the debt category without taking without taking what's called credit risk without taking the risk that a company that uh, that the bond fund has invested in gets into trouble okay so we have two queries coming in i think i think this is a pressing issue that we just discussed right our parents and the fact that they constantly invest into fd in, mm. into gold so what do you do with them and also what happens with the next generation so i'm just going to take those queries one by one uh, first up jack has written to us he says the next generation could see a retirement crisis as they won't be employable beyond 50 and there will be no pension so how does one tackle this and i think uh, there is another uh, query that has come in from uh, some Someone similar, uh, Anand Nambiar has written to us saying that since there's no defined pension for government employees, how does one plan for regular monthly income post-retirement? So I think this whole post-retirement, what do I do, how do I grow my money is a, is a pressing issue. So, so I think the two are linked. So let's let's take Jack's question first. I think a very good question. I don't think it's going to be possible for us to say, uh, for any of us, to say that I'm 50, I'm going to stop working, hang up my boots, because uh, already for people in your and my uh, socio-economic strata, uh, socio strata, life expectancy is approaching 85. So if I retire at 50, I'm going to find a 35-year retirement in India. That's very, very difficult. So my reckoning is not just 50, we'll probably work into our 60s. By the time by the time my generation enters the 60s, I think many of us will work well into our 60s so that you know we probably have a 20, perhaps a 15-year retirement. So as, uh, as quality of life improves, that medical care improves, we will work longer. That will obviously mean we'll have to reskill ourselves. Uh, I can see my, you know, our generation doing lots of online training to reskill ourselves again and again to stay relevant in the job market. Linked to this question is the is the retirement plan. And this is where the financial plan that you need to do with your uh, registered investment advisor becomes so important. What you need to do is figure out that once I retire, and what age do I retire is a call you have to make. Once I retire, what is the annual income I need? Obviously, the higher the income you need, the bigger the pot that you need to build. If your pot is going to be, if you want a big pot at retirement, then you need to save that much more between now to retirement. For most people in, say, my age group, mid-40s, um, you know, saving around 30% at least of our income uh, uh, is, is, is essential, right? How we save it is links, goes back to the early part of the discussion. How much should go into risk-free assets? How much should go into equities is, a, is, a, is the second judgment call. But the first call on how much we should save uh, is a call that will be driven by when do you want to retire? What uh, annual income do you want in your post-retirement years, right? And basis that, you decide the pot that you need to build, back it out, that gives you an annual amount that you need to save, and then that annual savings will have to be bifurcated into, into risk-free assets and risky assets. But our parents' generation, the utopia they enjoyed of yeah. investing in you know, flats and gold and you know, uh, government bonds and fixed deposits, I'm, unf I'm afraid the world is not that simple anymore. Okay, I, I, you know, I still remember my dad's words telling me that uh, whenever the market falls, he's like, oh, I'm so glad that I have uh, my money in FDs. And then when the market rises, he's like, see, one day the market is going to fall and then FDs will be the safest bet. But of course, yeah, I mean, it takes, a <laughs> it takes a long, long time to change that mindset, right? What do you think? Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think this is exactly the point, right? And that, and, and in a way, Sonia, we are the in-between generation, right? My, my, my children uh, are going to up in, grow up in a world mm -hmm. where investing in equities using brokerage platforms and using apps and mobile phones will be second nature to them. And as you said, our parents' generation grew up in a world where the stock market was seen as some sort of, you know, very, very risky affair. Gambling, right? Yeah. Our generation is the transition generation. And, and, and for our generation, I think this trap that one of your, your previous questions alluded to, this trap is real. I see so many people in their 40s and early 50s, they haven't prepared a big enough retirement mm. pot. Uh, whatever pot they have isn't being allocated in the right way. They have too much in risk-free assets and physical assets, too little in equities. And, and as a result, I really, really fear for people who are in the age brackets of, say, 40 to 55. Okay. They are the people, I think, most at risk of not having saved enough and saved in the wrong asset classes. Okay, well, we hope we uh, could we can spread some kind of financial awareness towards uh, you know financialization of your savings. We'll do our little bit to make sure that happens. Thanks a lot, Saurabh, for joining us. But that is completely uh, curtains down on this edition of Smart Money. Thanks so much for watching.